go out with a driving instructor uh, who is familiar with uh, driving with hand controls and can give you instruction on how to operate those efficiently, um, you know, kind of in the safest method. So I, I guess to answer your question, most people do pick it up very quickly. Um, you know, there's maybe been a, a handful of people over over the years that I could think of that maybe just needed a little extra time. But I've never had anybody that just absolutely could not figure it out. Um, uh, it's something that can with I, a little bit of practice, um, pretty much anybody can can pick up. Do you mind if I put them with a cautionary caveat? Yes. This is Larry. Um, so Hi, I, Larry. You know, I, hey there. So I, I, I was injured when I was 19 years old. So I, I, I had actually, you know, driven my feet for, you know, what, three years or whatever before that, four years. Um, and then um, when I got back to driving, it was, it was real easy just to, you know, obviously, because, well, first thing, my legs are paralyzed. So my feet aren't going to work anyhow. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I was going forward for gas and back for break. And it, it, it took me no time at all. But cautionary tale. Years later, I needed to get a different hand control, and that hand control went forward for brake and back for gas. Do never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, let them try and switch you in that regard. Because day one and a half after having my van, I drove it through the garage door when I was putting mm. on the brakes. <laughs> and we had to move out of the house for like two or three weeks to, yeah major major work so yeah never let them do that when you get used to one one direction with your hand control stick with it i don't think yeah. that they they do forward for gas anymore typically well they're gonna have to because <laughs> they, they 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 did a modification for me um I got the Minox and the Minox was forward for breaking back for gas. And I found somebody to do a modification for me. It works great. More often than not, forward is for break and uh, different ways of accelerating. Uh, the EMC system actually is kind of backwards of that. Uh, so that's one of the few exceptions to it. Um, but I think, so your point, your point being, you had one style uh, of accelerator or, or one style of hand controls. Um, again, the brake is pretty much going to stay the same. It's always going to be a push towards the floor for your brake, but you had a different type of accelerator motion. And then you switched to a different type after your brain has already kind of been programmed for that one type. Um, I, I, I definitely agree with you on that, on that caution. If you are familiar with one style it is typically better to remain with that style, especially if you've had a number of years of uh, practice or driving with that. Um, it's not to say you can't learn a different style that you can't ever switch, uh, mm -hmm. but you definitely want to be cautious about that and have a reason for it. Yeah. Um, I think it's yeah, and important. And it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't a push down, actually. It was a push towards the, towards the dashboard, pull back. So I, I just had a push pull yeah. system. It yeah, push-pull push is what yeah. they call that. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, you know, and I I hope this wasn't the case, but, um, you know, I, I would I was find it very bad if a driving evaluator or a mobility company said, you really need to switch. Um, we would prefer that you stay with whatever you're comfortable with. And to that point, even if a driving evaluator says, hey, we recommend that you drive with a push-pull system or we recommend that you drive with a push-right angle system uh, or whatever it is, if you don't feel comfortable with that, you should say something. You should say, I don't feel comfortable with that. Can we try a different style um, or try to understand why it is that they're recommending that system? definitely be an advocate for yourself there. Um, you know, if you don't feel comfortable, N nobody should force you into one particular thing. If you're saying, Hey, I, I don't like that. Um, they, they, they weren't forcing me. It was legal technique. It was, it was a, all I'll say is that it was legal and I wasn't allowed to use the <laughs> system I was used to. So I had to get a different system. And 
the department of yeah. have said, hey, we got this system here, so let's try it out. Yeah, uh, that's all. Okay, all so right. if that comes up, you know, my recommendation is to spend some time with the driving evaluator again. Um, you know, because it is kind of like learning to drive again because it's a totally different style. Okay, I have a follow up question. So I will still retain full use of my legs, but I want to be able to drive with my hands instead. So will my brain think, oh my God, I've got to slam on the, are, are the foot controls totally disabled when you are driving with the controls on the steering wheel? So the, the brake is not disabled. If you have an electronic accelerator, it it does uh, only allow you to operate one or the other on the accelerator side. Um, I, I, I will say though, if you're going to drive with hand controls, you want to stick with driving with hand controls. And uh, if you're having issues with your feet, like trying to jump in on it or get in the right. way, right. That's um, what we, I'm we do have, yeah, so we do have uh, what's called a pedal guard that we can install, and that would block out the controls at your feet. Okay. So if you're having a hard time with that separation, we could physically block off those controls so that you don't have to worry about that. The other, uh, the other reason the pedal guard comes into play is, uh, I think especially with uh, spinal cord injuries, uh, uh, sometimes you get spasms uh of the legs and so uh it's important to block out those controls to prevent you from accidentally uh initiating those the brake pedal maybe not quite as important as the accelerator pedal obviously if you you know mash your foot onto the accelerator pedal we've got a problem um braking isn't super great either but it's probably the lesser of two evils if you were going to bump into one um James, but, yeah, we can definitely address that. Is my slideshow uh, back? Yeah, you've got uh, steering aids with secondary controls up. Okay, I just want to make sure you can see it. Yeah, let's go ahead and play that video. I, <laughs> I was making mention of this one earlier. Uh, so this is a another form of spinner knob uh, where the secondary controls are actually right on the spinner knob. So they're they've got kind of a um, I don't know what kind of grip you would call that, but they've got a grip on the spinner knob and then they're operating the secondary controls such as the turn signals or horn uh, with their thumb uh, on top of it. Um, again, this could be used for any number of different functions. Uh, probably most common is going to be like your blinkers, headlights, wipers, things that you're going to need more often uh, throughout the course of driving. Um, you know, in that situation, you know, uh, air controls like AC and heat, your stereo, um, those are kind of, uh, I guess less important, uh, at the time. There are ways of controlling those features as well. Um, but like this, uh, this steering aid is really just trying to capture the, the most important ones. You know, you, you could wait until you're stopped at an intersection, uh, where you can actually take your hand off of the steering wheel and, you know, punch in a different temperature. Um, but uh, yeah, this is kind of a nice way to make it so that you don't have to take your your hands off of the wheel to operate these different uh, secondary functions. Yeah, and just to elaborate that, like on your standard, um, you know, knob on the steering wheel, and then so you have your one hand on your knob and your other hand on your, you know, push pull brake or whatever. Um, um, brake acceleration system you have and then so you're driving and you need to make a turn you have to let go of one or the other to hit your blinker unless you have a secondary system like this so this allows you to really like operate a lot of those controls while keeping your hands on the um, you know brake and the steering wheel at the same time That this has all been great information for me, so I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, low effort and zero effort steering. Um, uh, I think Jose was uh, making uh, this point earlier. There are ways of <clears throat> reducing the effort uh, 
for the input on the steering or even the brake system as well. So if your strength is low, um, you know, or if you just don't have the, the amount of movement uh, and the strength to be able to turn the steering wheel all the way around, uh, you know, securely, um, there's ways for us to reduce that, that input. Um, there's a couple different ways that we go about it. Um, it just depends on the vehicle and what type of reduction you need in effort, but it goes all the way to zero effort. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say on that other than just, um, it, it'll reduce, uh, by quite a bit. Um, yeah, th this system is great for some of the quads out there that, that, um, you know, have the ability to make that motion and turn the wheel, but maybe not enough strength to do it with the normal power stream. And so by, you know, adding like a, one of the tri pins or the quad forks or one of the other um, grip aids to the steering wheel, and then reducing the effort that it takes to steer that wheel, um, it, it opens up um, being able to do that without some of the more extensive modifications that we'll touch on later. And it's funny, yeah. Like, from just looking at that picture, it looks like she is using an electric gas and brake with a steering wheel extender and a tri pin with zero effort steering. Yeah, and I've seen that with other quads um, that I know that um, use the electric gas and brake, but um, with the zero effort and an extender and like the tri pin are still able to use the steering wheel itself and not have to to go the next more expensive step for some of the uh, other steering options. Yeah. And, and I think the cost definitely plays a part in some of these choices as well. Like you said, it, um, we'll talk about the EMC system, uh, which should be an even more simplified way of uh, operating the steering and gas and brake. Uh, well, simplified, or I guess, I mean, easier way. Um, but oftentimes if we wanna keep price cost down uh using maybe an electronic gas and brake along with this zero effort steering is definitely doable um so again just looking at every every situation differently and you know what works for one person may not work for the other yeah, and speaking of emc um, yeah yeah i'll kind of what do you know about deal. that yeah, James, if you want to talk about some of the technical stuff, and then I'll get into my personal experience with it. Cool. As this video um, So, yeah, we're pretty lucky. Uh, Casey has some personal experience. I think it'll be neat to hear from him on that. But this is uh, both kind of the Cadillac of uh, driving controls and the most invasive of driving controls in terms of uh, the installation uh, process that we go through as a as a mobility equipment dealer. Um, everything is uh, dialed into, actually, it's showing it right now, uh, this touchpad. And uh, you can start the vehicle, you can operate your secondaries, uh, and it, it kind of serves as uh, the brain for this operation. On the, the left-hand side uh, is the gas and brake. Um, there are motors or servo, big servo motors, basically, that are attached to uh, the, the different drive systems on your vehicle. And so with very, very little input um, or movement, you can operate the gas and the brake and also the steering system. So uh, off to his right, there's a tri-pin. Uh, um, whatever you call it, tri-pin holder, tri-pin uh, extension. Um, and as he turns that little wheel, you can see the wheel on his vehicle is turning. Uh, so again, this is the most extensive way of going about it. Um, they also offer this same system in a joystick model where you are actually just moving a little joystick forward and backwards and left and right uh, in order to operate all of your, your functions. And so this is for somebody who uh, really has pretty limited uh, movement. Um, 
and uh you know would would still want to drive a vehicle um casey i think your experience on this is is huge so why don't you share about what you know yeah yeah so i i'm a c5 c6 quadriplegic um i would say that i'm maybe a lower functioning c5 six than some of the others i've met um i did a meet with a driving evaluator. I, I went through the whole evaluation. I tried the, um, you know, the steering wheel extenders. I tried the, um, the uh, no resistance on the steering wheel with the tri pin on there. And I, I was able to drive around a parking lot, but it would not have been safe out on the road with other vehicles and all that. Like I just don't have the range of motion and the strength to, to operate the vehicle, even with those, um, you know, low resistance um, uh, um, options on there. And so for me, like, I was like, well, I mean, I, I still really want to drive. Like, what are my options? And that's when, um, you know, I, I found out about the EMC controls. And um, my setup is pretty much identical um, to the video that I played here um, with just a little bit different placement on my touch screen. But, um, you know, my, my left, I my left arm, I put in the tri pin, I pull back for uh brake, I push forward for gas. And that is, um, it must be all electronic because it is so easy. Like I barely have to pull back and I'm hitting the brakes and I barely have to push forward and I'm giving the gas. And then my, my right arm is in the tri pin. Um, and so as I'm turning those little circles, it's, it's turning the vehicle or the steering wheel for me. And so, um, I have a ramp fan. I'm able to pull in. I lock down with my easy lock system. Um, I put my arms in. Uh, I use a touch screen to, to start the vehicle. And then while I'm driving in that in the left um, tri pin with my gas and brake, if I just rock my wrist to the left a little bit, it starts these um, secondary tones. And each tone, I have the first tone hooked up to left blinker. Um, the second tone hooked up to right blinker. And so I can operate everything on the vehicle without ever having to let go of either of those um, tri pins. And so it, it just opened up a world of independence that I didn't even know was out there. I've been injured for um, almost 24 years and um, th this is all new to me. I've, I've just been driving for a year now. Um, and as a quadriplegic, I have to get help with so much stuff, transfers, dressing, bathing but I can operate a vehicle on my own. And it's, it's just, it's, it's been a, a life-changing experience for me. I have, a, a, I have a question. With all these adoptive controls and you, you learn how to do this with an instructor, is this reported to your insurance company? Does your insurance go up because of this? Um, that's a complicated uh, answer. Yeah, that's a complicated <laughs> answer. <laughs> for, Sorry. For me, no, that, it's a great question. I did reach out to my insurance company and say, like, I want to add coverage to my vehicle because I have some very expensive controls in here. And if, you know, somebody totals my vehicle, somebody runs a red light and hits me, like, I want these, I, I want the value of my controls. Um, also, not just the value of my vehicle, because I want to be able to, you know, get back into driving on something else. Um, now that, did raise my rates some because I, I wanted to extend the coverage over what the normal coverage would be on, on my make and model in your uh, vehicle. So, you know, I, I think it's a very complicated question. I understand, but, I understand that. That's a really you know good point. You want to protect yourself, but does the insurance company look at me as being more of a danger on the road if I'm using hand controls as opposed to every other driver? The I, the insurance company is not going to look at you as more of a danger. I mean, they really can't uh, discriminate in that sense just because you've installed CAN controls. Okay. The reason why you might tell your insurance is just to protect value of your equipment. So okay. it's really going to depend on the type of equipment that you have. I mean, let's just say as an example – you spent a thousand dollars putting equipment into your vehicle. Is that worth paying for extra insurance? Because they're going to treat it kind of like property insurance. Sure. So is it worth you know paying a little bit extra every month to have insurance coverage? Whereas uh, something like the EMC control system, or even just adding like a full wheelchair accessible conversion to a, a minivan or SUV or something, 
those are uh, a much higher dollar. You know, you might be forty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars, and so having coverage through your insurance obviously becomes a little bit more imperative. Um, but as far as like saying, well, just because you drive with hand controls, now you're a higher risk. That that would not happen, or at least well, it shouldn't. Yeah. Um, okay, I've never you. heard of that happening. Yeah. The one um, thing that I would say you as a part of the process. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm just going to say the one thing that you should do is once you start driving with your hand controls to cover you while you're driving in the event of an accident is get the your license modified to include the hand controls in your license on your license endorsement. Yeah, yep. endorsements. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. I it was actually just about to mention that. Um the the second part of that is uh adding an endorsement to your license. Your driver evaluator uh will probably talk to you more about that. Um Oregon specifically, uh the the laws around hand controls are a little bit in the gray area. Um but what should happen as part of the process, uh, like Jose said, is uh, you should be uh, going to the DMV and saying, hey, I, I use hand controls um, and they will add an endorsement. Uh, typically, you would do it with your uh, license renewal. They would add an endorsement to your license that or sorry, I'm sorry, a restriction to your license that says, uh, hey, yeah, I use hand controls. Um, and obviously, if you were driving without those hand controls, then you would be out of compliance of that restriction. But uh, to Jose's point, if uh, uh, let's say you get into an accident and you didn't have uh, that restriction on your license, the insurance companies could potentially, not saying they're going to, but they could potentially go to the length of finding out that it was not on your license and, you know, maybe making the accusation that you shouldn't have been driving with those hand right. controls and then finding you at fault. Um, but it's so no different again, than, Oregon is kind of an odd state, but. Well, it's like no different than, you know, driving or adding the restriction with lenses at glasses and stuff like that. Oh, good correct. Point. Yes. Good point. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It it is kind of a self uh, uh, self proclaimed restriction in a way that you know nobody like when when you get the hand controls installed, you know we're not reporting that back to the DMV saying hey that we just installed hand controls for this person. It is your responsibility to to take care of that part. Um, but I think the point about kind of your liability, um, you certainly would be uh, uh, in a better position if something happened, uh, if you did go through that channel and had the, the proper restrictions. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, um, this is the end of the slideshow presentation and I'd like to open it up just for questions and comments and, and maybe people share their, their stories of where they're at. Uh, but I do want to thank James for being here. Um, thanks to Oregon Mobility Solutions. Um, thank you, Vicky, for you chiming in and, and sharing your experiences and Jose too. Um, but I'm going to turn off the presentation and, and we can just kind of open it up to questions. Yeah, and um, thank you, Casey, for... Uh, thanks for, for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I, I want to stress again to what I was saying at the start of it, which is, um, you know, this is probably a small list of all the options that are available. And I think our biggest encouragement to you is if you're not driving right now, or if you're looking into the future or saying, um, you know, I would like to keep driving, but I don't really know how that's going to be possible. We just want to make sure that you see that it is possible, um, you know, with very few instances where uh, somebody can't continue to drive the the physical side of it. We're going to find a way to to get you behind the wheel and be able to drive. I, I think Casey's a great point uh, or, or a great example of that where, 
uh, I don't know if, how long you had been thinking about it or, um, you know, if you had even the information to know that it was possible. Um, but, uh, you know, that's what we want your takeaway to be. There's a lot more questions and there's a lot more, you know, research and talking that probably has to happen behind the scenes later, um, you know, and uh, talking to one of us uh, in the, the mobility equipment side or talking to a, an evaluator, you know, those are kind of some of the next steps of it um, to answer more of those questions. But we just want you to know it's it's possible and, and encourage you to do it. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll share I'm... one quick and then I'll, I'll open it up. Um, but yeah, for me, like, I mean, I was 20 years old when I had my injury and like driving again was something I thought about, like, you know, a day after my injury. Um, but it was a long time before you know, I, I got the, the information and, and really started to see, there was just no information about other quadriplegics, my level driving um, back in the very early 2000s. And so, you know, um, I, I waited a long time. I wish I would have done it many years earlier. Um, uh, but yeah, it like, it, it's possible. Like if, if I can do it, you can do it. Uh, that's, that's what I want to share. And then, um, you know, when it came to like getting my license again, um, that was definitely a, uh, an experience. You know, I, I went down, uh, my licensing expired. Um, um, so when I went down, I had to f um, file for my permit. I did a like a written test and got my permit. And then, um, you know, after my vehicle was finished and I did some time with a um, driving instructor and all that and learned my controls, I just booked a, an appointment like normal um, at DMV with a, with a uh, driving evaluator and, and, and I let them know like, Hey, I drive from a, a completely different system. And, and I just did the drive test like normal. I, I mean, obviously I drove different, but everything else was the same. And my driving um, evaluator never mentioned anything about like different in endorsements or anything like that for hand controls. So I don't know if that's just something she wasn't aware of, or if it's something Oregon doesn't require, but um, yeah, that, that's my side of it. I would love to give my experience once yeah. Kind of goes. Oh, hey, so I just wanted to share on that note, um, the place who installed my my permanent hand controls, uh, my driver's license was still valid and everything, but they wouldn't actually start installing until I got my endorsement. And so I just wanted to share that. So because that, that's different, like a lot of people have said the other thing, but like occasionally you run into that. And so all I did, I was just using the like little clip on um, ones you can buy online and so I just did a driver's test with those and got my endorsement and then was able then they were able to put mine in that was all I wanted to share Thanks, so Anna. Hannah that that's probably going to differ from company to company um they're all going to have kind of different and, and it comes down to liability of course you know uh we have obviously great liability in installing this equipment into a vehicle and so some companies are going to say this is the process this is the process there's no law or rule that's that says that that um you know is the process um again uh it, the hard part is how do you go get the evaluation done or uh, sorry, how do you go do the drive test if you don't have the equip equipment? So what I know for our company uh, and for all the companies too, the important part is the evaluation. And so making sure that you have uh, somebody who's certified to evaluate for your specific scenario and recommend, you know, uh -huh. the type of hand controls or et cetera. Once we have that, that, at least for again for our company that's what allows us to install the hand controls and even that i will say is not actually a law this is just something that is uh kind of good practice or uh you know helps protect us as a company because if you just come and say hey I, I want hand controls and we install them and you didn't learn how to use them properly and you let's just say you had no business using them so to speak right and then the the finger is going to get pointed back at us well why did you install those hand controls so that's why there is are some of those processes but the important part from my perspective is the 
uh, evaluation. The only time yeah, that we probably, don't really need that evaluation. That's probably ahead, sorry. why they asked me to get the endorsement because I never had gotten evaluation. So you to saying that makes me think of that. Whereas oh, like, like I know oh, Casey spent yeah. a lot of time with them and they had like seen him drive and all that, but I didn't, I never had an evaluation. Sure. So that's probably why I had yeah. to do it today. Yeah. So, and that's going to be another from company to company type thing. Um, one of the like kind of exceptions to the evaluation from our side is, you know, if you've obviously been driving with hand controls for a long time and we're doing a very similar setup, let's say you're changing vehicles out, we don't require you to get a whole new evaluation for that. Again, I'm only speaking for our company, so I don't want to, uh, Vicki, you could say whatever your guys' process is, no. um, but we would, if somebody had that clear experience um, we would still install hand controls into the next vehicle if you're just transferring them over. Yeah. Um, Jose, I know you wanted to share, and Vicky, you're up after Jose. Well, I was injured really young. I was 15, so I didn't get to experience driving before my injury. And um, it wasn't until I was in my 30s uh, that, that I started driving. I did start driving in my early 20s. I did the initial evaluation where I did try the EMC system. Um, then years later, um, I ended up going through vo uh, vocational rehabilitation to get my driver's eval. And um, I ended up with a different system similar to Casey. Um, high tech, I have a, a, a system called um, the, the, the Scott dry, driving system or Scott DSI driving. system. Yeah. Yeah, Scott uh, driving. And um, yeah, it opened up the world. I, yeah, I live in New York City. Uh, they say you don't really need to drive, but um, I've driven to North Carolina. I've driven to Canada a couple <laughs> times. Um, yeah, it opens up, you know, the whole world of possibilities, and you don't have to wait on anyone. That's the best part. Yeah, uh, Vicky and yeah. Oh, sorry. I was uh, just going to chime in too. You brought up, sorry, Vicky. I, I don't mean to cut you off. Um, you brought up vocational rehab and we can talk a little bit more about that. But if you have a concern about funding this, because some of the equipment can be really expensive, there are some options out there if you are working and there are more qualifications than just that. But if you are working or trying to obtain work and one of the barriers to that is transportation and you need a vehicle vocational rehab in Oregon does have a program to be able to fund uh, some of those vehicle modifications so um, again talk to your mobility dealer um, the veterans administration is another one that has some funding options and maybe there's other avenues to help pay for some of it uh, sorry Vicki go ahead oh I was just gonna say on um, my first when I first got my uh, driver's, well, I had my driver's license, was injured, uh, got the hand controls installed. And at that point, um, I wanted to get the designation on my license and I wasn't due for renewal for years. So I went to DMV and said, you will give me the test again. So I had to fight for it. Um, but I, at the time, I was working for a big law firm and they're like, oh no, you should get that on there. So, it's, I mean, most people wait until they get a renewal, but you can get it sooner and it's, it's better to get it on your license just be, for whatever reason. I've never in 30 years heard of an insurance company using um, no designation on your license as a way out of paying an insurance claim. In theory, they could, but I've never heard that happening in Oregon. So... Yeah, it's good. It's good to get it as soon as you can the designation and a lot of the companies. So I work for United Access. And if we have a customer that's new to hand control, they don't have a license currently. And so they need to actually go through and get a license. We have lent vans to people with hand control so that they're able to not have them installed in their vehicle yet and they can go get their license and, you know, and then have them installed later. So, I mean, all, I think James does this too. Sometimes you, you just have to work around the system and get it done so it'll work for you. 
Okay. Yeah, I didn't have a vehicle when I got my license. I went through the uh, the evaluators. I went in the evaluators um yeah. vehicle. Actually, he made the appointment. Yeah. I failed yeah. the first time, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I, Vicky, that's that's awesome um, about how you'll lend a band. I, and I think that's great right. for and some it, of that. And in that in that case, we would probably be going with them unless yeah. uh, one of the evaluators. But we're not going to just send somebody off without a license to DMV with one of our vehicles and hand control. But, you True. know, we would go with them or we would have, you know, Jim Ilg or someone with them so that they could get their license. Yeah. And I, I and think, I think it's a, a little harder when, um, you know, you're a quad that has very specific very, control needs and there's just not the much. option to do that. So that's when it gets a little exactly. trickier yeah. to, to get around the stuff. Yeah. And I think to your point, Vicky, too, like just have that conversation with the mobility dealer or the evaluator, because we're right. going to try to find a way to make it work for you. Like, uh, we're not just going to send you out on your own and be like, figure it out. Um, no. Like, just have that conversation. And maybe we, you know, Vicky's company, you know, maybe they help help you by lending a van or, you know, maybe we... I don't know, you know, whatever it is, yeah. we just, just have that out. conversation. Yeah. And we can figure it out. Cause we, we want to help you do that. Like, right. again, like the whole message here, like we want you to know that it's possible for you to drive, that you can drive, you should drive. Like that is your right to get behind a wheel and go do what you want to do. So. Right. And I yeah, thought I'm, it was I'm gonna, interesting. Oh, Back in 1990, when I got my first set of hand control, they were installed at a place that's no longer in business. Um, <laughs> and I, I said, well, do the pedals, I mean, how do, what, how do these operate? And their response was, you'll figure it out. And so just know <laughs> right. that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody now, like, <laughs> explain stuff. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to chime in. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, Casey. It's it's Larry, by the way. I, I I'm off because I'm at work and and it's just staring up the ceiling. Anyhow, um, no problem. C Casey, you were you were you were talking about how um, uh, what you started you were injured in like the early two thousands or something like that. Yeah, uh, in two thousand. Yep. Yeah. Step aside, young man. I was injured in eighty eight. Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. And Got um, me by two years. and and I did my. I think we found our winner, huh? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I did. I, so I did my rehab at Casa Colina and um, and they had like a, just a, you know, tester van to say, hey, you know, here, let's see if you can get in. And it was just it was he had to like move this and move that and, and adjust this and, adjust, and just to get me into the steering side. And I was so discouraged because it was just it was their one system and it really didn't work for me. So. I kind of, you know, was miserable for a few more years. And then in 94, um, the Department of Rehabilitation, I was a client of theirs. I, I'm in California, by the way. I was a client of theirs. And and I went to the mobility evaluation program at Rancho Los Amigos. And they took me out there on their, this is an old system, the wells Inberg. Do you remember that one, James? wells wells Inberg, yep. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, that, was, that was like, twist throttle. They, 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 yeah, they called, they called it a trough. You know, you lay your arm in. And then you just you turn your hand left or right, and that's like and, my... okay, yep. And I was I, I was driving that around, you know, the the area, and I was doing okay on flat land. And then she took me into the dirt, and she made me do donuts in the dirt, and set off my spasms. <laughs> she and she said to me, "Yeah, you're not gonna drive. No, you can't drive on that oh. one system." Okay, so for the for the next like three years, four years, or whatever, I I you know didn't drive, and then I got into a friend's van and. I said, let me see your steering. And I'm like, whoa, I could do the steering wheel. So then that set me on my way to getting a system. I got a system and it worked great. And and then I got another van and, and it worked great. And then I got another van until um it didn't work great and the brakes didn't work going down the freeway. <laughs> and uh yeah, ended up towing the vehicle. So cautionary tale, just I mean, you know, James, I'm sure you're the greatest installer here in California. It's hit and miss. And um, you'll get great people. You get people that are difficult to deal with. Um, 
one guy put my tri pin on on my steering wheel and as i'm driving home the tri pin fell off because it didn't lock into place <laughs> i mean yeah so 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 you know some of you are just you know thinking about driving some of you just started driving i'm just telling you listen to your van um listen to you know every single you know burp and 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 and, and um you know whatever else whistle that it gives you cuz um you know you, there there could be some devastating problems and that, yeah. um so so then uh you know i, I i've got a i've got a minox in there now and the minox working great um and yeah so it's uh i and i work with oh oh i know what i was gonna say um who was it uh jose jose you said you have a scott system in, in there now mm -hmm. yeah and um i i'm lucky in that DSI is located close enough that I could drive up there. And, you know, um, uh, and uh, so I, I've gone up there numerous, numerous times. And um, you, are you familiar with Junior? Have you ever talked to Junior? Uh, he's great. Junior is a wizard. I mean, he, he can do, he can do anything with my van and he seriously has done um just so many things and he's really great so i'm i'm just about ready to get a new van um i've got my mobility evaluation on thursday so i figured i would jump in on here and see if there's any new systems i need to know about um and uh and i'll definitely be going through dsi again to get the van well emc is coming out with a new system it's, yeah um, uh, the emc3 Avet three or whatever. Yeah. yeah, not not happy with computerized controls and electronic controls. I want I want the manual thing. <laughs> less cumbersome, less breakdown. James, uh, one question: Are you part of Namita or your mobility dealer? I am. Yeah, so our our company is not a part of Namita. Um, there could be a lot of discussion on this topic, I think, but. Um, so in Mita is there, and they are a set of standards uh, uh, that the mobility dealers and the manufacturers of the products are supposed to adhere to, you know, different processes, procedures, and, uh, you know, safety standards. Um, there's specific reasons why our company has chosen not to be a part of this. Um, some are going to argue it's an industry standard. I'm not sure that it's necessarily an industry standard, but the point, uh, and I think back to what Larry was saying, is you want to make sure that who's installing your equipment is good at what they do. Um, and so doing your research to figure out, and, and if if Amita is something that you value, you know, see if they're an Amita dealer. Um, there are some limitations where uh, we get into some some custom uh, uh, fabrication uh, for very specific needs that if you are a part of Enmita, they will not allow you to do those because then you are out of compliance of their standards. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we've chosen not to be a part of it because it actually limits the scope of work that we can do. Um, but again, you know, you, you should look at the company's reputation, go online, make sure that they have good Google reviews, make sure that they're registered with NHTSA uh, to be a vehicle it's modifier, uh, make sure that they don't have, um, uh, you know, negative uh, Better Business Bureau, <laughs> you know, feedback, um, you know, meet the people who are actually yes. installing your equipment. Um you know, say, hey, who's your shop manager? Let me meet them uh, before uh, these controls are installed. Um, so I, I think doing a little bit of due diligence there, because um, kind of to your, I can't remember who brought it up about California. Um, you could me. have a company that has whatever, that was you, Larry, uh, that has whatever certification um, but maybe their technicians are brand new and they've already, they've only, you know, been working there for a year or two, but they have a certification. They may not be the best person to work on, on your equipment. So, 
you know, just going through your due diligence to figure out, hey, you know, do I trust this company? Do I trust these people to work on it? I, I know everybody, I, I guess I can't say everybody, but typically people in this industry want to help, you know, um, they want to help see you do what you want to do. Um, but yeah, you do have to protect yourself and advocate for yourself as well. Um, I've had my, I've had my interactions with Namita and and in a cryptic way, I'm going to say to you, James, the reason why you guys aren't is because you don't want to join the old boys network. <laughs> uh, you you said it. I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah. There are mm -hmm. some politics behind it. I don't have any problem saying that. I think, again, one of the biggest reasons why we've chosen not to is because it does limit the scope of work that we can do. Uh, no. And there are... Uh, modifications that uh other companies will not do that we're able to do uh that helps very specific uh specific people um i, I don't think we really need to do a complete discussion on in um no, no, no. but yeah. i think do do your due diligence uh find out if the company is reputable i i mean just off the top of my head i if you said hey you know tell me about your shop manager or your lead technician i go hey uh, you know, here's what their capabilities are. Um, they both have been in MEDA certified in the past, and they both have 20 to 25 years of experience in the industry. Um, and so that's what you want to look at. Um, yeah. Again, I, I think the, the in MEDA discussion is is something that we could spend a lot of time <laughs> going back and forth on. And, and I, I can appreciate, too, that we have uh, another dealer on this call that they are a part of Enmita. So, um, you know, I think out of respect for that too, um, there's advantages and disadvantages and you decide for yourself what, what parts you value. Samantha, did you have a question? I'll come back to her. Um, one thing I'll I'll say to what Larry was saying, and Vicky and James, I'm sure you guys can both, you know, attest to this that not every mobility dealer is is the same, and especially when it comes to sure. some of the higher end controls like uh, EMCs and that stuff. Like, you want to make sure that the shop you're going to has experience with that, and it's not their first install, uh, especially on on some of those types of systems. Um, you know, most of the shops are pretty capable of doing your standard push pull or push twist and, and those type of systems for the most part. But yeah, definitely do your research. Yeah. I wanted to ask a real quick question. It was about um, rental. If you want to rent a van, um, what kind of um, certification or uh, um, evaluation do you have to have if you just want to rent one? They won't Bro. rent them to you with um, hand control, so it doesn't matter. Oh. <laughs> it, I was going to say, I, it, it does it depend. depend on uh, what your needs are and uh, what the purpose with it is. Uh, most of the companies do offer rentals of mobility yeah. vans, um, but the, the hard part is because everybody is unique and requires a different set of equipment, um, it, it's hard to match that every single time. And if we spent a whole bunch of time installing, you know, a lot of equipment for this one person, just from an economical side or a financial side, that's not obviously going to make sense for, for the mobility company. Um, could it be done? Sure. But um, it's usually an economical decision. Uh, you know, maybe we make $500 on a rental or something and, you know, we're installing three thousand dollars worth of equipment so um yeah it's just not quite as practical for for a driver but for a passenger yes you can definitely rent a, a mobility van um now i will say uh most of the rental car companies do offer rentals with hand controls i know enterprise for sure and i think most of the major rental car companies do offer that. So if you do have the capability of getting in and out of a regular vehicle that's not modified, um, you can request a vehicle with hand controls and they will provide a vehicle with uh, basic hand controls. Um, they're typically like just a mechanical 
uh, what we'd consider push right angle or push rock or uh, one of those styles. And so it would be just the gas and brake uh, that's going to be modified. So it, for a limited, uh, you know, specific circumstance, that will work. Yeah, United Access, all three Oregon stores have a uh, rental vehicle with just hand controls. Um, and they're sure grip and we just disable them in between. But the person has to have a designation on their driver's license for hand control. And usually, I mean, we require that they're going to be renting it at least for a few days. And that vehicle has to be available. So call ahead. You know, the problem is like if you get in a car accident or something, obviously you can't call ahead. And if that vehicle is already rented out to somebody, you know, or if you require even secondaries, they're not going to have secondaries. It's just a basic hand control and you got to be able to transfer over. Uh, for, we have one vehicle with a transfer seat base, but normally you're just going to have to leave that passenger seat out and then transfer straight across. So it just call. And like I said, it's, it might not be the closest store that happens to have the hand control vehicle because it's already rented out at another store to a person that didn't need the hand control. So um, it's they're all different. <laughs> I, I have one quick comment on that, and then I'll get to Samantha's question that's in chat. Um, I I do have some friends that are paras that are you know able to transfer right into vehicles and use the very just standard mechanical um, um, hand controls that have a um, a um, portable set. That like if they're gonna go out of town and fly somewhere, they'll take their portable set with them, rent yeah, a car, that. and and you know because you can attach those fairly easily. You know it's not right. the best long term situation. They're not the safest um, if you don't get those things on the really tight and stuff. But it is um, you know an option for some of the more high functioning people that are, that are able to use some of those controls. Yeah, I've done that like in Hawaii, none of the dealers will put hand controls in the rental van. And so I had my kid crawl on the floor and through those, and, and that's what I, you know, but they're, they're not great for long-term driving, but they're fine for travel stuff. Yeah. Um, Samantha, your question was, um, where can you go for an evaluation? Um, I did share a slide earlier in the presentation that had the the three evaluators that I'm aware of um, here at Oregon, and I can email you all all that information. Um, but it's as far as my knowledge, there's one in Salem and two in the Tigard Portland area. Uh, but I'll make sure you get all that information um, after the slideshow. Did I miss the cost of that too, or as well as the cost of a rental to rent a van? Do you have anything idea? What, what are we thinking about? Um, for a rental vans like ours are around 150 a day. What are yours, Jane? Yeah, I think we're pretty similar. Usually there's going to be, it, it, and again, you go out of town, there's probably a range of it. And I apologize. I've probably got some background noise now. <laughs> we kept the kids quiet for a while. Um, we're good. Uh, there's probably a range. I would say most companies now are in the, you know, 125 to probably upwards of 180 a day. And then there's usually discounts for doing like a weekly rental or a monthly rental. I think ours are pretty, they might even be the same or very close to what United Access is. Um, so yeah, somewhere in that range. Um, Vicki or James, are either of you aware what the cost for evaluation would be if you're private pay, no funding whatsoever? It's a huge range. If, you, if somebody <laughs> just needs hand yeah. controls, I mean, totally different than if somebody needs the high tech driving control. And yeah. then it kind of sometimes depends on the person as well, because some people are really a lot more time intensive. Yeah. I can tell you what mine's cost. Sure. Time in. So I actually happened to get the. Um, cost breakdown from uh, Access VR. So I purchased my vehicle from a regular dealership and didn't have any modifications. Um, it was sent to the mobility dealer that sent it to Braun, that sent it to California, then shipped it back. 
So I paid 28, and this is back in uh, 2016. So add <laughs> another 30, 20, 25,000 to this cost. Um, Wait, for your evaluation? No, I'm talking about the modifications. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. I think the specific question was for the evaluation. Oh, the evaluations. Itself. Yeah. The evaluations um, are, I don't know how much that one cost. Yeah, and yeah. and Vicky's right. I, so every everybody's going to be maybe a little bit different depending on how much driving instruction you need. That's going to affect the cost, and then also what type of system uh, you're looking at. Like an evaluation for an EMC system is going to be so much more intensive than the evaluation for just a basic set of hand controls. If we were just talking a basic set of hand controls, um, and please don't quote the exact amount on this, but let's just say between $600 and $1,200 would probably be fairly typical for just a basic, basic evaluation with kind of limited amount of driving involved. Um, and, and then, yeah, you know, obviously Marissa, as it gets more, what's that? Marissa's, Marissa's quite a bit less expensive. Um, she can start sometimes at like 250 if it okay. is, you know, using her vehicle and she has all sure grip equipment and she's done even less with gas pedals that, I mean, I've been shocked at how inexpensive she is. And if Jim Ilg has to actually write a report for say Voc Rehab or something, you know, the price goes up more, but I think Jim starts probably closer to 750 and up. Um, don't, don't quote me on this price whatsoever, but I believe if you're doing more of the high tech equipment and stuff, it can get up into like maybe the 3,500 range yeah. for a, a full eval and report and stuff. Um, right. For for my eval, I was uh, I was with Jim Ilg, but he also had an occupational therapist there um, and a a driving instructor there too. And the three of them kind of all were trying to help me figure out, you know, using the lower tech options with stuff. And, and then, it, you know, it, it was a lot of trial and error because I'd never tried anything to figure out, like, these won't work for me and, and we need to go into the higher tech route. So there there was some very extensive swapping out stuff and, and being evaluated by the, an OT and really seeing what my uh, capabilities were and stuff. My worry is being a quad, like some things I can't do, like turn on the windshield wiper, you know, I have to use two hands to turn on the windshield wipers, that kind of stuff. So I have to stop the car and put, you know, I can put two hands together and, and you know, cause it's a, a turning knob, right? So I can, I have a way of adapting to it, but it's not like you can do it while you're driving, right? You can't, so you, that kind of stuff. And well, I don't know please. if they for the e yeah. kind of. Go ahead. You could, yeah, say for something like that, you can add brain sensing. Um, so you would never even have to add the switch or you could have add, add it to the secondary control. I'm just talking Did about you say yeah, brain sensing? Having secondary controls and trying to get an eval. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I was thinking. And you know, so I, I, I do drive a car without an eval um, kind of things, but not not too often. But um, so that kind of things I can do that kind of stuff. I mean, like turn signals and stuff are all, all easy to hit with your, with your hand. It's just the small things like turn the heater on or something while you're driving can't do that can't can't get the you know there i guess there's modifications that i could i you know i can use i use a pencil sometimes and i can move the knobs and stuff but um so i was wondering on an eval if they would check that kind of stuff that yeah uh, yes a, a good evaluator like the one the ones that i know of here that is all part of the evaluation and yeah. they're they're looking at all that stuff so when they make their recommendations all that is taken into consideration so they would probably flunk you on that kind of stuff then, right? Because I can drive by pulling, you know, pulling it. I got to push pull kind of thing. And uh, Well, it, an evaluator is not there to flunk you per se. Like, um, they, so the DMV evaluator is there to flunk you if you're not capable. But um, a driving evaluator, which is somewhere you would go to like find out what would work best for you and get recommendations. They're not there to flunk you. They're there to really support you and help you in your journey. And, and find what is going to be the best that works for you. And so they should be taking into consideration that, you know, maybe hitting the blinkers was difficult or the wipers and, and explore the secondary controls that are there um, that would work for your uh, ability. 
Okay, thank you. Kikoa, do you have any questions? This is this is sort of out of left field, but I'm just wondering, how does it work with um someone like an able-bodied person driving a, a, a fully adapted vehicle? I mean, do they just like slot in and like, you know, if 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 I want my caretaker to take over the wheel for a bit or something, is do they need a, that that designation on their license or or, or what, what goes on with that? So in, in pretty much every situation, there's a way to operate the vehicle with the uh, traditional gas and brake pedal and steering wheel. Um, we, I kind of to your point there, we don't want other people to operate your hand controls. Um, you know, say you take your vehicle into the mechanic shop. Uh, we don't want them using the hand controls because they're they're not experienced with them. And there have been cases where people, you know, wreck vehicles because the mechanic, you know, oh, what's this handle over here? Let me play with it. And they end up running it into the shop. So depending on the type of controls that you have, there's going to be different ways of uh, bypassing those controls. Um, for a basic set of hand controls, the uh brake pedal and the gas pedal i'm talking about a mechanical version the brake pedal and the gas pedal are still going to work um there is a lockout for the accelerator on the hand control so that somebody can't just come in and grab the handle and accelerate um there's no lockout for the brake because they figure that's not a huge deal if they push the brake um but yeah, in every case, so even like the EMC system, there is actually a way to disable uh, the EMC system and just drive with the regular steering wheel and gas and, and brake lever. Sounds good. If, if, you're, if you're driving from your chair, there's going to be no chair there if you think about that. And so like I've had like, you know, some mechanics with my van and they say, oh, yeah, I just put a seat in there and I just sat in there. And I'm like, but how did you drive? And they figured it out or, you know, other for other people, it's really confusing. So just it depends on what you got in there. Yeah, oh, that ahead, that James. can be a that can be a tough one. Um, so uh, if you know that you're going into a mechanic shop like that and you have the ability to have somebody else bring it in for you a lot of times with like wheelchair vans you can put the original seat back in um even though you might have a lockdown system and other equipment it's still possible typically to put the seat back in and then have somebody else drive it to the mechanic shop that would be the ideal situation um we understand give me the, you hold I mean, on to the seat <laughs> Yeah, give, give we, we do understand. I mean, um, and, and again, this is going to be probably more of a company policy as well. Um, if your only way to get to the mobility shop to have something repaired is you driving it in, uh, we have other ways of doing it. Like we could take a, a wheelchair that we have and maybe lock it down so that it's secure in order to get it from the parking lot into our shop so that we can work on it. Um Typically, people don't want you driving into their shop because of insurance reasons, but that could also be a, a kind of a last resort if that's the safest way that everybody deems uh, to do it. But yeah, oftentimes there's going to be a way to get the the driver original driver seat back in there, and that's ideally how it would get worked on. I, had I can't tell you how many. I can't tell you how many oil changes. Sorry. I was going to say, I can't tell you how many oil changes and tire changes that I've had from sitting in my driver's seat 50 feet up in the air. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. okay. I'm not, I'm not going to have them drive, especially on that, that, uh, the, what is it, the, the tire, um, the tire balancing yeah. rack or whatever, the wheel alignment rack. I'm not having them drive it up there. It's too yeah. difficult. So I'm like, you know what? I'm driving it up there. <laughs> there, there have been some times where I've like put in a neutral and they pushed it. At least yeah. into like you know the other the, not not the not the not the wheel alignment rack, but the other thing. Uh, but but most of the time, you know, I, I I've got a um, Midas I go to, and they're really cool with me, and they you know come on, drive it in there. So to get a good mechanic, yeah, and shop, if you have that, scary. yeah, and if you have that relationship and they feel comfortable with it, I mean that could make that could make sense, especially 
uh, you know, with the type of driving system that you have, maybe that that's the best option, but, um, mm -hmm. yeah, there, there's different ways of look, uh, making that work to be able to repair a vehicle. Franklin, did you have something? I was just going to say, uh, Les Schwab would, even with just portable hand controls on my pedals, they wouldn't, they would they didn't want to get in, they didn't want to move the car. So I had to do it. Just the simple manual controls, they were scared of them. So, you know, the portable um, put on there. So, the, you know, I mean, the pedals are there. It's just the, the controls are up higher. Um, and they were there. And I told them that they had hand controls on it. And they said, no, you bring it over here, you put it in there. And then I had to transfer out stuff. So, I mean, my vehicle that just has hand controls, I just turn them off and can take them anywhere that nobody has a problem with it, including Les Schwab. So, oh, good. Uh, in my experience, I, I've done a few different things. I've, I've, um, I've taken the the OEM seat out of the garage, locked it in, and had my wife drive it down, and that way the mechanic can take it into the shop and stuff. And then I've had um, some place let me um, drive it into the shop and park it and get out for them to do their work. And then for like some of the routine maintenance, like oil changes and stuff, I use like a reputable drive through um, oil change place that, uh, you know, nobody gets out of their vehicle. So I, I'm able to just pull right in and, and let them do their thing. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Otherwise, I, I know it's late. Everybody's probably hungry and um, we can start shutting this down. Thanks, Casey. And thanks, All James. Good. Thanks. I appreciated it. Yeah. Thanks a lot for the talk. It was nice. And uh, I appreciate it. I'm you know, kind of bummed that I got in late, but I just found out because I looked on the boards and, and it was advertised on there. So, uh, Larry, this is yeah. um, this will be recorded and added to our YouTube page. So um, I have your email address from registering for the Zoom. So if you want, I can uh, email you the, the full version of it. Oh, cool. OK. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Uh, Vicky, I don't know if you can hear, but I just want to thank you, uh, you know, for chiming in and, and giving your um, thoughts and opinions on a lot of stuff through here. But thanks again, Casey. I'm going to leave. Bye, everybody. Yeah, see you later, Franklin. James, Bye -bye. thanks, man. I, I appreciate your knowledge and, and all the uh, help you gave to this. Yeah, thanks, Casey. I appreciate it, too. Thanks for the opportunity, and thanks, everybody else. You're still here. Nice to meet you. Hey, thanks, James. Appreciate it.